Um, tomorrow, Governor Murphy uh, will be here to lead the daily briefing. Uh, throughout the past week, he has been fully engaged in our response uh, to this public health emergency. In fact, he was uh, with us on the phone during our briefing uh, that we just had as staff, and uh, I know we are all looking forward to having him leading our team in person tomorrow. As Governor Murphy announced uh, a short while ago, based on guidance from Commissioner Persicelli, we are recommending the cancellation of all public gatherings throughout New Jersey of more than 250 individuals, including concerts, sporting events, and parades. Governor Murphy reported to us that he spoke directly with the leadership of several of our sports teams and large venues in the state, and they are all supportive of this decision. And for any events that uh, do take place, we encourage uh, attendees to keep the six-foot buffer between themselves and others. Our full efforts must be put to aggressively mitigating the potential for exposure and further spread. And social distancing is an important part of this strategy. We ask you to continue urging your listeners and viewers to keep doing the right thing to protect themselves and others to help prevent or slow further spread of coronavirus. Since yesterday's briefing, we have received six new presumptive positive test results. Our cumulative statewide total at this moment is 29. And there have been no further deaths reported related to a co coronavirus case. Commissioner Persicelli will give more detail uh, on these new cases. Assistant Commissioner Newworth uh, and Infectious Disease Epidemiology Program Coordinator Dr. Lisa McHugh is with us today, as well as Colonel Callahan and Education Commissioner Dr. Lamont Repolette. Uh, to answer questions. Additionally, uh, the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Doug Fisher, and Homeland Security Director Maples are available to answer any questions you may have that fall under their purviews of leadership. Uh, with this, I'm going to turn the briefing over to Commissioner Bersagelli. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Nice to meet you. We all have been saying this is a rapidly changing situation. And clearly, the world is a little bit different today. The WHO, the World Health Organization, has declared a pandemic. A pandemic is increase, often sudden, in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected in a population that has spread over several countries or continents, usually affecting large number of people. The WHO's announcement does not trigger any new funding, any new protocols, or any new regulations, but it is an acknowledgement of the disease spreading across several continents. It is not an acknowledgement, acknowledgement that the situation in New Jersey had, has worsened to the point where we would say the risk is anything more than low. The Trump administration has taken steps to ban foreign nationals entering the United States from European countries other than the UK for the next 30 days and to restrict all visitors to long-term care facilities that are not medically necessary. In the United States, large gatherings are being canceled to prevent the spread of transmission. I'm sure you all know that uh, uh, New York Governor Cuomo canceled the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. The NBA has suspended its season after a player tested positive for coronavirus and college campuses are sending students home. Governor Murphy has just announced the cancellation of mass gatherings of more than 250 people. This step is important because these large events bring people from multiple communities into close contact with one another, and that has the potential to increase COVID-19 transmission. 
Also, local school boards are making decisions about school closures. We may see more school closures. This step, along with hand hygiene promotion and social distancing, are well-established methods to prevent the flu transmission. Data suggests that early implementation of these types of initiatives can reduce the spread of the flu and, in fact, was used during H1N1. In front of us, we have a different circumstance, a novel coronavirus. So we will continue to monitor this situation on a daily basis and keep you informed as to our decisions on school closures. As you have heard from me in the past, cases will continue to grow around the globe, the nation, and in New Jersey. Today, we have six new positive cases. A 16-year-old female from Englewood uh, is currently hospitalized at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center. We received that positive from LabCorp, a commercial lab, so therefore we have very little information on this uh, uh, case. A 66-year-old female from Montclair Township, Essex County, currently hospitalized at Mountainside Hospital. Uh, all of their hospital, uh, their status, by the way, is unknown uh, mm -hmm. since we just got these. Um, their exposure, uh, this particular case, exposure to COVID-19 is pending. 51-year-old male from Butler Borough, Morris County, admitted to Chilton Medical Center, does have an, expose, an exposure to COVID-19. A 23-year-old male from Bridgewater Township, Somerset County, may have been exposed to COVID-19 through a close contact with a Pennsylvania resident who has been deemed to be presumptive positive. 53-year-old male from Manalapan Township, Monmouth County, uh, currently hospitalized at Centra State and identifies as an exposure to a, firm, a confirmed case of COVID-19. We have a, a female a resident from Teaneck Township, Bergen County, age unknown. Uh, specimens were collected at Holy Name uh, Medical Center, and uh, we do not know whether she is currently hospitalized. She did have an exposure to COVID-19, exposed to a confirmed case at a synagogue uh, carnival. We have notified uh, the New York State uh, Department of Health. Uh, and all attendees of the carnival on March 1st should be self-quarantined. Based on the positive uh, cases that we're seeing, uh, we're beginning to assign uh, risk categories uh, to uh, our counties. Let me go over them with you. Currently, Bergen County has 13 presumptive positive cases. That is still considered based on the population at Bergen County to be moderate risk. Burlington County has two cases. The risk is identified as none to minimal. Camden County, one case. Risk status, none to minimal. Hudson County, one case. Risk status at this time, none to minimal. Middlesex County, two cases. Risk category, none to minimal. Monmouth County has four presumptive cases. I'm sorry, five presumptive cases. Uh, that risk is considered above minimal, but not quite moderate. Passaic County, one case, none to minimal risk. Union County, one case, none to minimal risk. Essex one, Morris one, and Somerset one, all considered none to minimal risk. The reason for giving you the risk categories is again to emphasize the fact that overall in New Jersey, we believe the risk is still low. 
There are 37 persons under investigation. These individuals will be tested in our state lab. We do not know how many specimens are at the commercial labs. We have to accept that as the response to the virus continues, there will be disruption in our daily lives for the short term. Some schools will close. Events will be canceled. Some individuals will need to self-quarantine. And there will be other steps taken to protect the residents of New Jersey. I know this causes concern, but this is all part of a response to reduce the impact on our state. We're working around the clock and our public health and emergency preparedness response teams are coordinating throughout government as well as throughout the healthcare sector and other local public health partners. We certainly will get through this, but we have to work together. The public has a large part to play as well. Individuals at increased risk for COVID-19 complications due to their age or severe underlying medical condition such as heart disease, diabetes, or lung disease, should be taking steps to reduce their risk of exposure, such as avoiding large gatherings and avoiding, for sure, individuals who are sick. It's important people in these categories speak to their health care provider about their risk, what medications and supplies they should have on hand if they, it is determined that they have to quarantine, and have a plan when to seek care before an outbreak actually occurs in their community. If you have loved ones that fall into these categories, please encourage them to take the steps for their health and to limit their exposure. As the situation is different in communities around the state, the guidance from public health uh, that public health will be providing will depend on the picture on the ground. For example, Bergen County will be taking different steps to limit exposure like a county right now, like Salem, where we haven't seen any cases. Each community is unique, and appropriate mitigation strategies will vary based on the level of community transmission, characteristics of the community, their populations, and their capacity to implement strategies. Communities that have isolated cases or limited community transmission and no widespread exposure might be implementing different actions than a community that has widespread or sustained transmission. We are monitoring the situation closely, as I've said, and continue to provide guidance for public health and healthcare professionals and communities to be able to effectively respond to any additional cases that may be identified in our state. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, we open up for Q&A. Oh, Repolette. I'm so sorry. Commissioner Repolette. Governor Murphy, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. <laughs> Governor Murphy, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, Health Commissioner Judy Perticelli, other cabinet members and I have been working in concert on all issues related to novel coronavirus COVID-19. To date, 182 districts have closed or are closing for professional development related to COVID-19. 12 districts have closed or are closing for precautionary cleaning. Nine districts have closed due to possible exposure to COVID-19 in the school community. Three districts have closed or are closing because of confirmed exposure to COVID-19 in the school community. And one district has closed due to a presumptive positive case in the school community. My team and I have proactively been working with our district leaders to help keep the community informed and prepare an event of school closures. In the past week, we have held the superintendent's roundtable to discuss school preparedness and planning for potential increased spread of COVID-19 and release guidance regarding requirements for public health related school closures. Hosted conference calls with other with a broad range of stakeholders, groups to strategize on COVID-19 preparedness. These calls included non-public schools, faith-based community organizations, charter schools, and districts operating preschool programs. The NJDOE serves in the Governor's Coronavirus Task Force chaired by our health commissioner. We established a school preparedness subcommittee to convene a range of stakeholders to identify challenges and opportunities in coronavirus planning. Through these conversations, we have identified some common concerns. Internet access for virtual learning. We've seen a lot of innovative solutions developed and implemented at the local level. For example, 
Some districts are looking to provide both internet-based and paper-based home instructional activities. Some schools can preload instructional materials on laptops that students can take home. Laptop laps in food security. Local schools, New Jersey Department of Education and Department of Agriculture all recognize the importance of presenting laps in food security in the event of a school closure. We have advised school districts to consider options available to their community to continue providing service for students eligible for free or reduced price meals. In collaboration with the New Jersey Department of Agriculture, we're exploring every flexible flexibility available from the United States Department of Agriculture for schools to continue providing meals. In order to provide swift communication with the field regarding closures, we will update the New Jersey Department of Education website with district school closures twice daily. Our website is www.nj.gov forward slash education. I repeat, www.nj.gov forward slash education. We understand the significant impact that COVID-19 has on the school community and will continue to support them as we combat the spread of virus and keep our families safe. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to hear from uh, Colonel Patrick Callahan. Thanks, Lieutenant Governor. I'll just take a minute to assure everybody that the State Emergency Operations Center is activated and staffed. Uh, the primary reason for that is to support our, our counties and municipalities, whether that's with a resource request, information. Uh, tomorrow morning, myself uh, and the command staff here at Emergency Management will have a conference call with all 21 county OEM coordinators, uh, as well as our state emergency management planners from our respective departments across the state for those departments to brief out uh, so that our message is one voice, uh, it's clear, and if they have any questions or need anything from us, uh, we will remain uh, open 24-7 to, uh, to address any needs that come through uh, the Emergency Operations Center. Thanks, Lieutenant Governor. Okay, and uh, Q and A, and you're first. Yeah, when when the uh, specimens go to the commercial lab. Uh, there's a real lag time before we get any information on the case. When it comes directly to our lab, we collect that information at the time that we get the specimen. So is there then a drawback to using these private labs from your perspective when you're trying to do contact tracing? The commercial lab, and I'd like Chris to uh, elaborate. The commercial lab um, advises our communic communicable disease uh, service of any positive results. Uh, it just requires a few additional steps uh, to get the local health officer involved and to do the contact tracing as compared to if it came right to our lab. Is there anything you want to add? And that's correct. There's, there is no lag. The information is transmitted to the Department of Health, which is, you know, is in constant communications with local health departments who do the associated contact tracing. So. Um, there is no... Just a few extra steps in the process, I guess. Yes. Uh -huh. Commissioner, um, you had indicated in your comments that uh, the governor has announced that no gatherings more than 250. The statement he put out and what the lieutenant governor, the wording was, people should not go to these gatherings. If social distancing and mitigation is the best way to Uh, that's a great question. I mean, the first part of it is uh, we're recommending the people uh, that they uh, cancel any gathering over 250, recommending that people not go. Uh, the bottom line is, and the question came up, um, what if it's a wedding? Where are you going to have 250 people? Uh, what if it's, uh, you know, a private event? Part of the personal responsibility of those people uh, is to um, consider uh, the impact of having 250 people in a, in a contained space for a period of time. Um, I think that we're allowing uh, a little bit of leverage for that. 
a little bit of leverage for uh, religious uh, events, but we're really asking people to make their own decision. With all due respect, if I may follow, you said yesterday, I believe, your primary responsibility is to protect the safety and health of the people of New Jersey. If somebody's got to cancel a wedding or scale it down, wouldn't that be included in that mindset? Um, from a public health perspective, absolutely. So then why not mandate? I think that we're as close to mandating it uh, as uh, we felt necessary at this time. Yes. Dave, can I just follow up for a second? Yes, go ahead, Colonel Callahan. Just on, on that, that recommendation from the governor um, to, again, to cancel those large, it is just a recommendation, not a mandate, but under the state declaration of, you know, the state of emergency declaration, it could get to that point where the gov obviously has that authority and would delegate that either through to myself uh, to say, well, you know, MetLife stadiums, horse tracks and all that. But right now it is, is strictly just a recommendation. Thanks, Dave. Yes, and we haven't gotten there, but I, I just, you know, we I think that the administration and particularly Commissioner Persicelli has effectively communicated out to all stakeholders in the New Jersey uh, you know, our family. Uh, and what is happening is many of those that um, run large venues and sporting, they are, just as people are self-quarantining, many of the sponsors of these events are making the choice to postpone their events. So I believe that's why we don't feel at this point in time, uh, but it can come, as uh, Colonel Callahan pointed out, but we are effectively communicating with every conceivable stakeholder in the state, and people are making decisions to postpone their events. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that information with me today. Um, uh, send that to Alex, and I can get it for you later. I just don't have it in front of me today. I'm sorry Brenda. about that. Mm -hmm. we, talked to a doctor, um, sorry. we talked to a doctor today from uh, Holy Name, and he said that they're sending specimens to one of the labs because they're getting faster responses than when they send the specimens down to the state lab that uh, the word he used for the state lab was inundated. Currently, the state lab does not have any backlog of specimens. So the characterization that um, we are un inundated, um, I don't think is accurate at this time. I'm not, um, you know, I don't understand the specifics of the lab and the process that um, that physician is particularly using. Um, but I can assure you right now that the lab capacity um, for the public health and environmental laboratories is appropriate um, for, uh, you know, the volume we're seeing currently. Yes, uh, Mike. If the suggestion is um, that gatherings of 250 people um, not happen a day at school in lots of places is more than 250 kids. So are we getting to a point where we are going to expect a stronger direction from the state as to what public schools should be doing, or private schools for that matter too? So the 250 students, we don't have 250 kids in a classroom. We have them separated throughout the entire school. Um, we are now currently looking at the students based off of this uh, social policy right now, looking at the students in cafeteria, making recommendations. We'll be making recommendations tomorrow to our school districts to, to modify their schedule. And, and to have lunch within the classrooms so we can kind of make sure that we're on the same page with the Department of Health recommendations. Yes. If schools would need to go virtual for a period, which they are being told to prepare to do, we've spoken with a number of parents who say they can't work from home. They're, they're trying, they're scrambling to come up with some kind of backup childcare plan because they can't necessarily, they may have to burn all their sick days, take unpaid leave. Do you have anything to, to say to these parents who are struggling with this? 
So currently we talked we about this. <laughs> yes, we, we did <laughs> talk you. about it. Judy and I, we speak often, um, I think daily regarding um, the concerns of our district. And we notice now we're looking to maybe um, within our preparedness plan, have a contingency plan within that so we can actually have um, school districts or schools that may not have these, these uh, exorbitant amount of exposure within their communities to be able to have some schools open up, whether it's half day depending on the circumstance. So right now we're looking at all options in regards to making sure, A, we provide our parents relief in regards to uh, child care, but more importantly also for food as well too. So we're looking at a lot of things. We're currently working with um, a group of task force of superintendents we have convened to make sure we actually get um, information from the ground to make sure their concerns is heard a lot easier versus from the top up. So we, we're considering all options and we're going to try to make sure it's seamless transition for a lot of our parents, whether it's half day, whether it's uh, school closure so and we're also looking at possible nonprofit organization within the community so there's a lot everything is on the table this is relatively new when it comes to our school we're pretty much um, creating a new educational system and everything is on the table Nikita yes right over here uh, so I think Atlantic City is scheduled to hold a referendum on a change in government on the 31st now obviously you're yeah. kind of the state's point person in that regard is there any discussion at this point about canceling or rescheduling that referendum uh, as a result? Of course, uh, yes, our Division of Local Government Services, of course, uh, is the pinpoint for overseeing Atlantic City. Um, I think that as we just saw uh, last week in five national elections that none of those states um, shut down elections, including the state of Washington, which is probably the biggest cluster in the country. I don't anticipate uh, you know, shutting down the vote on the 31st of March, but as, as the commissioner uh, has indicated, we are hour by hour, day by day, taking a look at what happens. If it has to come to that, we'll have to consult with the Attorney General, a number of other different entities within the state government to determine what will happen. But as of today, we have not uh, advised Atlantic City to shut down that referendum. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have the, the tracing of all of the, the people. I mean, that's a overwhelming task, and it, it's not information that I would get on a regular basis. When there's contact tracing, if it is identified that there is uh, public transportation involved, uh, that information then would go to NJ Transit. And as you know, we've stepped up and amplified the, the uh, disinfecting of all of our um, uh, uh, cars and uh, trains uh, as a result. Yes. A lot of people expect a lot of spread of COVID-19, not only in New Jersey, but ar across the country. Um, if, could you talk about, is that the case? And if so, why it's important to slow it down with regard to health facilities and opportunities to get people into hospitals and that whole situation? Sure. Uh, I'm going to start and then I'm going to let uh, Dr. McHugh talk a little bit about the curve and why you want to flatten that curve and why it's important. Um, there, it seems to be that particular people are getting hit pretty hard by this virus, that they do, do require hospitalization. It's about 15 percent. The others, about 80 percent, I guess, maybe a little bit more, are uh, able to stay home. But for that 15 percent, uh, they require, um, you know, specialized rooms. They require full uh, personal protective uh, equipment. Uh, on uh, the caregivers. Uh, they require an intensive level of care in our hospitals. So the importance of flattening that curve is to hopefully decrease the amount of people that are having major, uh, being exposed at all or having major symptoms and uh, overly stressing our hospitals. Most of our hospitals are working at capacity. They may have licensed beds, but their uh, staff beds are pretty full. So they're working at how they would handle a surge, particularly in their isolation rooms and in their intensive care units. It's best if we flatten that curve, uh, hopefully decrease the spread, and have fewer people exposed. Um, Dr. McHugh, do you want to? 
talk a little bit more about that? So I can just talk briefly about when we talk about flattening the curve, perhaps what that means. And so um, in epidemiology, we use something called uh, an epidemic curve. Um, and it's simply plotting the number of cases by some time frame over a period of time. And you'll see that kind of bell-shaped curve that many people are seeing kind of on the news stations. And so what we're trying to prevent with social distancing and mitigation activities is rather than having that very strong peak, you try to bring the peak down and have it come out over several weeks rather than having it over a shorter two or three week time frame. Um, and what that does is it kind of may not limit the number of cases that we're seeing, but it tries to flatten out or limit the number of cases that are occurring in a certain time period which means that our hospitals will have time to recover and to actually try to, to uh, prevent some of that surging um, that we're already seeing. Um, I think it's important to also understand that, you know, we are trying our best with some of the actions to really um, protect the most vulnerable, which we know are those who are older in age and have underlying medical conditions. And so, you know, those are some of the people that we want to prioritize to be able to get the care that they need, to get the testing that they need at the public health laboratories, and to make sure that um, even though there's not a treatment, there are things that can be managed maybe slightly clinically different and to make sure that they're getting some priority care um, to make sure that we don't have some poor outcomes. So I think that that's really um, where everyone needs to, to remember that that's where our focus is, is to try to protect some of our more, most vulnerable populations. Hey, this gentleman, and then I'll circle back. How many people can get tested per day for the coronavirus, and what is the recommendation if there's community spread for how much testing capacity we should have? So right now we can speak to what the capacity is for the public health and environmental laboratories. Right now, um, our capacity at the lab is approximately 40 to 60 tests per day. Uh, testing of individuals per day. And, uh, you know, that is appropriate, um, again, given the, uh, you know, the volume of specimens that we're testing that meet the CDC PUI criteria. Um, I can't speak necessarily to the LabCorp and Quest capacity or that of the other third party and commercial laboratories. But what we are seeing is that the capacity of New Jersey's um, diagnostic laboratory testing overall is increasing um, as more people need testing. Yeah. You will have the follow up. What is the recommendation if there is community spread? Like how much do we need to prepare for? Is 40 to 60 enough? Again, it's enough right now today based on the the volume that we're seeing. And as we expect as more cases come on, we're going to um, need to continue expanding uh, testing capabilities. And we're working aggressively with hospitals, universities and third party commercial labs to ensure that the testing capacity is um, appropriately scaled um, as the situation continues. There's also a lot of discussion on who needs to be tested. Even if people are showing symptoms, so they're symptomatic and maybe have had a nexus, but are very mild, uh, presenting very mild symptoms, the question is, do they really need to be tested? And that's a, that's a question that is being discussed uh, nationally. Um, if, not, if not internationally, uh, because it doesn't change the treatment. And that's a really important aspect of all of this. Testing positive does nothing to impact the clinical treatment of the patient. There's no vaccine. Treatment is all supportive care and symptom care. And so the ability to look at testing and the impact of positives can maybe show us the progression of the disease, but I have to uh, emphasize that it doesn't impact uh, the treatment. We, don't, we want to ensure that those that need the testing are able to receive that testing, and those are individuals who are sick, hospitalized, um, and should be prioritized to receive that testing. When you um, test um, individuals indiscriminately, um, asymptomatic as well, you flood the system with, um, you know, an enormous amount of um, specimens that need testing that otherwise would, um, you know, make it more difficult to, to prioritize and find those individuals who are positive. So we want to ensure that those that need the testing get it, those who are sick and hospitalized um, get the testing they need, and that the resources that we have on hand are appropriate, appropriately allocated to those that need it most. Yes. Ask you, Lieutenant Governor, yes. What changed 
between yesterday and today to prompt Governor Murphy to issue that directive for gatherings of more than 250 people, 250 people or more, uh, to be postponed or canceled? Um, I think that, that Governor Murphy has been on top of and focused on the coronavirus and the implications for his state, for the state of New Jersey. Um, I believe that as he monitors the situation on a daily basis, as he receives data uh, from the various administrators in state government, um, I think he was now moved to under, you know, understanding and making the people of New Jersey understand that because so little is known about transmission and, uh, you know, we, we know very little about this coronavirus. So uh, he is seeking to safeguard, use the deliberate precautions uh, that we know can tamper down uh, the potential of transmission. And I think that he has been guided by the scientific data that we have thus far. Yes. Um, Commissioner, we've heard a lot of discussion about, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion about people who are at risk having immune problems, heart disease, and so forth. That's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. But then there's this other category of older people. Um, I've heard 60, I've heard 70, I've heard 75 to 85. What do we know about the immune system with human beings and when it starts to be less effective and put people at risk potentially for something like COVID-19? Well, we do know that your immune system weakens over time, and that's why we always used to be 70, uh, particularly with this virus. I think it's down to 60. Be more careful. I don't know the exact time that the immune system are attacked. Uh, fact age that the immune system starts to weaken. We know that some people it doesn't weaken at all. Um, so, you know, out of abundance of caution, uh, the older you are, the, your system weakens a bit. Just be careful. Does it matter in terms of, you know, your overall health, uh, well, diet, Sure, you have to take good care of yourself. You have to have, you know, adequate sl sleep, uh, good diet, um, you know, uh, exercise. Uh, these are all things that we're constantly uh, urging people to be involved in. And, and you know that diabetes and hypertension, uh, heart disease and cancer are still uh, leading causes of um, uh, uh, debility and, and death in the United States. Yes. I have a question for the Assistant Commissioner. Um, earlier this week, you encouraged the federal government to release medical supplies from its strategic reserve. Governor Mur Murphy has also played a role in sourcing uh, medical supplies. How are those efforts going? Has the federal government released anything? Uh, they're going positively. Um, just earlier today, we've been in constant contact with uh, um, our counterparts at Health and Human Services, and we're actively moving forward with procuring supplies from the strategic national stockpile. Uh, I think uh, we described yesterday that uh, Governor Murphy has created an executive order um, and our commissioner of the Civil Service Commission is being guided by that. There have been um, some steps taken to accommodate those that uh, we believe should work from home, but there is no blanket directive that of the 30,000 state employees, they should all work from home. But yes, we are monitoring that as well. Are any of the, any of the currently positive cases or the pending tests healthcare workers? And are you confident about protecting healthcare workers now and going forward? Um, the, um, as far as I know, uh, there's uh, two uh, that are healthcare workers. One has been treated and discharged, uh, and there, uh, one uh, remains in the hospital. And we're really concerned about healthcare workers, particularly those that might be exposed uh, at a doctor's office, an urgent care center where we know uh, the vigilance, perhaps uh, someone just walking in, the vigilance perhaps is not as strong. We're also concerned about our healthcare workers in emergency rooms. That's where we're seeing uh, the most walk-ins that uh, could cause a uh, problem. That's why the, uh, the stockpile of uh, PPE is so important to us. Uh, and we are getting reports from hospitals that they're concerned about their inventory and we're following up uh, on every single one of them. The protection of the healthcare workers is so important because if they have to go into quarantine, it won't be one or two, it'll be a unit 
of health care workers. It will be 10 to 14. That's a problem. And are there plans for those health care workers? They, nurses just can't go home to a house full of kids if they're exposed. What, what, what are some of the steps the hospitals that you know of are taking now? Well, if the health care worker goes home on self-quarantine, right. we um, suggest to them to, to employ all of the social social distancing interventions uh, with the immediate household, not have visitors come into the house. Um, and they, they also get a risk category. Um, they're either high, medium, or low. They're either active or passive surveillance. And then we have uh, um, initiatives for every single one of them. I yes. Commissioner, I talked to a number of frontline healthcare workers today and they said that they feel their employers do not know how to prepare them to deal with and test the coronavirus and protect themselves. So in light of what you've just said, are you making efforts to make sure healthcare providers are better prepared and making those decisions known to the frontline workers? What are, what are you doing? Yeah, that's uh, great questions. We've met a number of times with the New Jersey Hospital Association uh, in terms of um, evaluating their readiness uh, for uh, this particular situation, and we actually met with them way before we had our first case because we had set up our original task force uh, the second week of January, and I think we started having daily meetings on January 24th. Um, we've heard that as well, so this afternoon uh, I'm going to have a stakeholder call with a number of our um, unions that uh, have um, healthcare workers as their participants. So I'm gonna hear firsthand the information that they're getting and we'll be following up on that. Yes. You have. I have a question about um, some of the cases you might have seen already. I, I think we today a 16 year old, I believe there was a 17 year old and an 18 year old confirmed in New Jersey so far. Um, I don't know if the 16 year old is hospitalized. It, I'm not sure if you said that, but um, the question is, those are typically the low risk population, right? Just given their age. I don't know if they have pre existing health conditions or not. Are you seeing in New Jersey cases where the low risk population, the young and healthy, are still being hospitalized because this virus is so severe? That's a really great question. Um, I don't, ha uh, Elisa, do you have the breakdown? Because we have noticed uh, younger individuals, um, which is uh, a little bit different than some other areas of the nation. Uh, we've tracked that. Uh, on our, yeah. Do you have it? I don't, I don't have the exact numbers for you, but I can say um, generally a lot of the younger individuals that we're seeing are mostly people who are who have been seen in an outpatient setting and are being tested. Um, I, I don't, I'm not going to say definitively, but I don't think that any of them have been hospitalized. Um, if they have been, it's been for a very minimal amount of time. Um, again, I think some of our, uh, the cases that we are seeing that are requiring hospitalization are in some of the categories that we've already mentioned, some of the older adults um, with severe underlying medical conditions. And so I think the trend that has been reported from other countries and, and other states is certainly something that we're seeing. I will also mention that this is a very limited subset. So um, having less yeah. than 30 cases is very difficult for us to make very definitive, um, broad statements about what we're seeing. I think we will continue to monitor that from an epidemiologic perspective um, on a daily Daily basis and track um, what that looks like, but um, at the current, um, with this very small number, we're seeing similar trends to what we see in other seen in other places. I, I, I can answer the question. Actually, uh, this is not uh, exactly up to date, but um, and it's very small numbers. But we're seeing a peak at 27 to 36 uh, years of age, and then uh, 57 on. So um, that 27 to 36, it's a little bit higher. Uh, I don't have the percentages, but it's a little bit higher. I do have the percentage, 7%. Um, that's that's, um, that's a different circumstance. Okay. Yes, Michael. Uh, question. Commissioner Rappelette, you mentioned earlier in, in your comments about um, school lunches and breakfast and making sure that that continues. So I was hoping that you and perhaps Secretary Fisher could talk more about what's being done in that regard and what could be done to make sure that service continues. Yeah, so there's certain challenges um, for us as far as agriculture, and Doug can talk more about that in regards to waivers. I know that we've submitted waivers to the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture for us yeah. to be able to have districts be reimbursed. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Second aspect is what happens when the school closes and you don't have these waivers. What are some of the things you're going to do? So that's the, the creativity, the outside-the-box thinking that a lot of our superintendents and district leaders are looking into um, to be able to look at food banks. 
uh, look at uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, but Doug can jump in and tell you exactly more from an agriculture standpoint because that sits in his department. But from our standpoint, we have been working uh, collaboratively and hand-in-hand -hand to ensure that, that that food security piece is very important. Yeah, obviously this is very important. We're working with Commissioner Repolat, the Department of Education, uh, the Governor's Office, Health, everyone. We want to make sure that the, that there are sites for the children to be able to eat. Right now, uh, we're working on non-congregate sites. We've already received a waiver from the USDA for a couple programs, uh, but that only applies to 41 districts. That's the State Food Summer Food, Pro Summer Food Program and the SSO programs. We're looking for a second waiver. We're expecting to get it uh, very shortly, which will allow the USDA to then have uh, the districts to be able to serve under the National School Lunch Program, which is something that they uh, very much know how to operate under. And that will encompass all the free, reduced, and paid uh, children uh, to get their feeding at a non-congregate site or other sites that they've have, you know, they'll be working on. But we have to get the clearance from the USDA uh, and we're submitting that right away. Uh, we're hopeful that we'll have that. We're, we, we expect to get it. Uh, and that will really answer the question about uh, feeding programs. Okay, Charlie, you've been trying to jump in. Uh, well, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. What um, prompted the governor's change of heart overnight? Was it the the the, the rapidly evolving set of uh, events outside the state? We saw the NBA. The commissioner mentioned that actions in New York, cancellations around the country. Did he feel that it was that? Did that force his hand? Was there concern that? the state might look like it's uh, a little slow to react if it didn't react and call for what you did today. I don't think uh, that is what guided uh, Governor Murphy at all in recommending that events of 250 uh, plus uh, be, be postponed. I think that I don't, and I definitely know he is not looking at what other governors are doing. He is prioritizing what will potentially thwart this disease from affecting and infecting residents of New Jersey. That's what he's been guided by. And as I said, each day we learn more. And I think we've now come to the point in New Jersey, particularly because when you look at the cluster like in Bergen County, we know that many of those folks were at the same congregate gathering. And we want to avoid that in New Jersey. That is what the governor was guided by and, what, and the science that we have thus far. But I can assure you, Governor Murphy does not look at other states and other governors. He looks at the state of New Jersey, the health and welfare of the people that live here. I, I, mean, I, I was thinking more, though, the total uh, atmosphere, environment. You had the president as well giving a national address. Uh, it was breaking news right up through the night about, dip, like we mentioned the NBA, there was this total atmosphere that things had gone up another notch, that this was going from just a, a this one level, yellow alert panic to maybe red. And so that maybe that it, it was time for New Jersey to get in with that. Absolutely not, uh, because initially what we heard from Capitol Hill was this was going to be gone when it got warm. And obviously that is not what is happening. Governor Murphy is guided by the best data he has available to him and also the concerns of constituents. So, uh, no, I don't think that he's, uh, you know, I think you're trying to describe has he jumped on the, the large gatherings because of other people doing it. No, that is, that is not what has guided him. Yes. The public health emergency declaration. Can you detail what are some of the, the you've mentioned going forward, you, this, these are recommendations to avoid gatherings. Can you legally mandate do not gather? Can you tell churches, houses of worship to, to stop? What can you do in, in, in terms of schools? What legal powers are left to you now? Mm -hmm. uh, Colonel Callahan. We can, uh, and that recommendation, if, if agencies or institutions choose not to follow it, we do reserve the right to come in and go, you're not having that event. You're not having that 
wrestling match, basketball game, concert. Uh, but we think that the recommendation in, in and of itself should be taken under advisement and people take it seriously um, and hope we don't have to get to the point of actually mandating it under the authority of that dec uh, declaration. Um, but we do reserve the right to do that. Yes. With regard to the Princeton party, that was such a large group of people at 47 there. Has the health department taken uh, a particular interest in that party? Have you had more dialogue with Princeton health officials about not any more than the interest in every other case, um, the, the contact tracing of every case. And, and I just want to talk about, um, you know, why today and not yesterday. Um, we're in this exactly one week. One week ago, we had one case, and now we have 29. The trajectory alone, uh, looking at that, in relation to the trajectory of what has happened in other states, I think is a motivating factor for us to step back and say, what further mitigation strategies should we undertake? It's one to 29 in one week. That's a pretty steep increase, not in relation to the rest of our population, but in relation to absolute numbers. And a, a question for the education commissioner. Uh, Summit schools have announced that they are closing, they plan for about three weeks. Is that the most that you have heard, um, any school district uh, canceling classes? And do you expect that some others are going to follow swiftly? So um, we assess school closures daily. We have our um, executive county superintendents in constant contact with the superintendents throughout the state. And we get information regarding them on a daily basis and a timely. So information like that, it feeds up and we notify the governor's office. We are aware that school districts are professional development that have been planned before in months based off of the calendar. We understand a lot of taking um, an opportunity to create preparedness plans and making sure these preparedness plans are with the whole entire body versus top down. So we, we encourage that. And we also just have it for snow days. We have, you know, obviously it was a warm winter, so therefore you have built-in snow days. So as a result of that, people are using those built-in snow days to ensure that they can provide an adequate plan or plan that will provide safety and well-being of their students. No, we, we actually provided Department of Education in consultation with the Governor's Office, Attorney General's Office. We provided our guidelines. And part of that guidelines, we looked at a home instruction and we broadened the definition for home instruction based off of public health concerns. So as a result of that, that kind of mitigates some of those uh, reasons or rationales for the 180 days. So therefore, we, give them, we gave them enough flexibility to allow them to work within that parameters to ensure that they can provide um, the continuous instruction for their students in Edinburgh. And they use whether it's virtual school as I talked about before a uh, paper so they come up with creative ways to ensure continuity of instruction I can't give specifics and perhaps Commissioner Persicelli uh, can but we do know that a number of people who have been affected uh, have connections in West Ch in, in Yeah, that, that is what we know. We know that several of them were tied to uh, events that happened at their temple. Um, and, uh, you know, that is how I am describing connected. And I don't know if Judy has anything yeah, there's a, a couple of index cases that uh, had, were back and forth from New Rochelle. Uh, and it, it's um, we pretty much connected all of them. And, and that's exactly what public health does. The, the contact tracing, where were you? Well, what did you attend? Who else was there? Uh, how what was your close contact? I mean, it is actually it's an investigation. Um, who hasn't had an opportunity? Yes, Jim. Commissioner Epelette, can you just go over the information about the school closures again? You said one was closed due to a presumptive positive case in the community. Yes. And then there were three because of, uh, my notes might be bad, but confirmed exposure. Can you just go over the difference there? Yes, so to date, 207 total school closures. Uh, 207. 182 school districts were closed for professional development related COVID-19. 12 districts have closed due to closing for precautionary cleaning. 
Nine districts have closed due to possible um, exposure to COVID-9 in the school community. Three districts have closed or closing because of confirmed exposure to COVID-19 in the school community. And one district has closed due to a presumptive positive case in the community. So we're working hand in hand to track this and we track this information daily and we, and we actually put down a rationale and provide that information up. As the Lieutenant Governor said, so we gather information and every day we assess that information and then we create a daily plan as a result of the information we gathered the day before. Um, I don't have that information right in front of me right now, but um, if you give information, we can get that to you. I'm sorry, I'm yes, not yes. asking something about the difference between exposure to a con confirmed exposure and a presumptive positive case in the community. What's the difference between those Could two you categories? Uh, did you use the term confirmed exposure? Uh, yes, we put um, is it information. Uh, I'm not sure that that's exactly, it's probably an uh, indication that someone thinks they've been exposed, have gone to their physician, and, uh, wants, and perhaps wants to be tested. What's, what's happening is um, there, we're getting an awful lot of rumors uh, around everything, but definitely around the schools. So-and-so's mom went to something and this. So I think that's probably yes. what's causing some of the closures. We only deal with the um, presumptive positive cases because they've been tested and confirmed. Right, but to follow up on that, like. On the website right now, there are different sections that say possible exposure, confirmed exposure, and presumptive positive. So if I'm a parent checking that site, I'm going to want to know the difference between those categories. Okay. So Dr. McHugh, I, I don't know what, who, what website that is. Oh, so, so, so we're, we're definitely trying to clarify that, put a definition page in there. But remember, we're ascertaining information from districts. So an example would be that um, my student was at a party, or I'm sorry, a family member was at a party of someone that may have been exposed. So as a result of that, districts are taking precautionary measures. Now, they can do that because, as we talked about, those built-in snow days. So as a result, they will use those days to close down to possibly do a thorough cleaning of the building or use that, those days to actually um, make sure that they have a preparedness plan. Okay. Just add something to that. I think, you know, there's a lot of this contact of a contact, right? So I think it's important to remember that a person is most likely infectious when they're symptomatic. So if you're not a contact with someone when they're showing symptoms, um, it's not the person necessarily who had contact with them, right? It's the person that had contact with the person who had symptoms. And so we're getting a lot of the context of a context of a contact, right? So we understand the concern and the fear, but I think it's important to remember that it's, when we do contact tracing, we're looking at individuals who have had contact with someone who actually was presenting with illness. Um, and so that's, that's how we conduct our contact tracing. And so there are lots of people who are concerned, rightfully so, that they may have had exposures. But um, again, we're looking at specifically those that have had contact with somebody who is at their most infectious, which is when they're symptomatic. Okay. Uh we're going to take a Charlie and then you, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, so Commissioner Persicelli can go back to her office and get some more data for you. <laughs> well, we're going to do one and a half because mine's real, real small. Uh -huh. But uh, the um, the 66-year-old man from Montclair, that case, did I hear you correctly or incorrectly that there's no known contact with a COVID-19? I'm just find, trying to find it. A uh, 66-year-old, you're talking about the Montclair? The Montclair, yeah. 66 year old, uh, year old female. Excuse me. Uh, exposure to COVID-19 is pending. We haven't, it, the, the oh, okay. uh, so information is still, uh, yeah, okay. I, yeah, we don't so, have it. So it's not, you're not sure yeah. whether that's a community spread or not. Now remember, we, we get this information just about an hour before we get in front of you. So I know it's uh, not as complete as you would all like okay. it to be, but it's pending. Follow up on the contact uh, tracing with the, with the healthcare workers. Any of them, do they get exposure from New Jersey cases? And were those was the exposure on the job or from community or, or in their personal lives? Uh, the two that yes. you're yes. Uh, uh, speaking about, um, I don't. Uh, do you do you recall? Because one was our, like our first case, and like I said, he's been discharged, but came from New York. Okay. Uh, so I, we're. I mean, I'm making an assumption now that it was New York. The second, I don't know. I don't know. Do you know, Lee? The second healthcare worker, we, we know exactly the pinpointed exposure to a confirmed case. Yes. Speaking of concerns and rumors, um, 
As you, I'm sure, are aware, there are concerns, rumors, worries about people are going out buying food, stockpiling water. From everything that we know about this virus, does it affect food or water? In other words, is that no. threatened at all? No. What would your advice be, what would your words be to New Jersey about this issue? I think everybody should follow good nutritional um, uh, foundation and good, you know, make sure that they eat well. And there's no fear that any of this virus is transmitted by food or water. Okay, thank you, everyone. And uh, you'll be briefed by Governor Murphy tomorrow. Thank you.